Seth, it's so good to have you back on the podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. So um, you wrote a blog post recently about the Beatles documentary, Get Back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a very interesting take on the different contribution of the members of the Beatles. And I thought that would be a very interesting place to start. First of all, congratulations on watching an eight or nine hour documentary. My wife and I found it fascinating and she wants to watch it again. I've had another good friend of mine say it was the most boring documentary in the history of documentaries, but clearly you liked it too. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's not for you, it's not for you. I would have watched eight more hours of it. I was fascinated by so many parts. Um, first of all, Let's think about the fact that the most famous musical group in the history of the world, at the peak of their popularity, decides to invite a documentary film crew to watch them write and record an album in three weeks and then perform it live. <laughs> All at the same time that they're pretty sure they're going to break up. Like, <laughs> what, what was the incentive? It was just fascinating to watch that dynamic. And so I tried to decode it. The second thing that was interesting to me is people say that Paul and John are geniuses. I don't think that's true. I don't think that people are born with musical talent. I think we earn it. It's a skill. And they were super skilled. Mm. And what I was trying to figure out is, what is it that we learn about roles by watching this documentary? And here's what I came up with. Ringo is essential because Ringo doesn't bring much in the way of ego to the table. His role is to allow people to do their thing. Hmm. George, it made me sad to see, needed to be punched in the face by John and sometimes Paul. He, every time he comes in with a song, he prefaces it with, this is not very good. And then he doesn't look him in the eye and he sits there hunched over. That's his method, his practice. Hmm. But Paul, Paul is the reason for the documentary because Paul needs that. He needs that audience, that deadline, and most of all, he needs to make John smile. That he is there showing up, doing his riffs, not for the fans. He wrote the fans off years ago. He has no patience for screaming 12-year-old girls. That becomes clear throughout the whole thing. He is there to put on this little show in the service of the big show. And John, John mostly brings in his stuff pre-workshopped, and John needs to seem like he's above all of it. And what I take away from it as a creative and as someone who talks to creatives is you should figure out who you are and mm. why that practice of whatever you've got is your practice. And this is the key thing. Is it helping you? And the, the reason the Beatles broke up is their practices ultimately conflicted and they couldn't survive with each other. And if you're a non-productive artist, you make one album every 40 years, it could be because your practice is flawed. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if you can show up and show up and show up and that work is, you're proud of it, well, then you found a practice that helps you thrive. Do you know who you are most like in the Beatles? Did you recognize yourself? Um, I like solving interesting problems and I don't, want to care what most people think about the work, but there's a few people I care very much. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the reason that I keep working with the same book publishing company is not because it maximizes my profit. It's because if Nikki likes something I did, I can do it again. And mm -hmm. having that opportunity to stake a claim in the ground, promise them I'm going to hand over a book, and then do it, and have Nikki say that I solved the problem in a way that she's pleased with, that is fuel for me. Mm. Nikki would be your editor? Nikki? Nikki's my editor, Nikki Papadopoulos. And uh, the other cycle that really works for me is when I hear from somebody who I don't know, who understood where I was coming from and uses the work to teach somebody else in a way that surprises me. That is fuel for me. I need a little bit of that because I don't want to be pedantic and I don't want to be descriptive in my prescriptions. What I want to do is open the door for people. And if they begin to get the joke and the rhythm and they can do it without me and they can teach other people, that's what I want to do again. Has that always been a big thing that makes you tick? Because I've seen that in your work. You know, I subscribe to your blog. I listen to your podcast, read your books, etc. But you really seem to have a genuine interest. You're not the guy sitting back going, look at the body of my work. Please enjoy it. 
You seem to be very interested in the work and particularly interested in students and what your students, so to speak, are doing. Has that been an evolution, Seth, or MO from the You know, a lot of us have an origin story. And my Mm. origin story started in 1977, teaching canoeing just north of you. And you and I have talked about this up in Algonquin Park, Canada. And that's where I became me. And I just keep trying to recapture that experience of what happens if you get a bunch of 14-year-olds who don't think very highly of themselves, who have had all the bumps in the road that typical 14-year-olds have had, and help them stand taller and breathe better and become generous, respectful human beings who teach the others. That's it. That's what I'm hooked on. And Mm. I would still be doing that to this day if it wasn't seven hours from here. Are you going back this summer? I am in five weeks, and this will be my four, my 42nd summer teaching up north. Fantastic. I'm so excited that the borders are open and you get to do that again. Yeah, I Another missed question. the last two years. Oh, yeah, haven't we all? <laughs> one, one thing that's really interesting is you, and, and feel free to nuance this or even reject the question, but you don't have either much of a team, like in terms of a staff, but like when you get your email, you answer very quickly, you do your own scheduling, I've got to ask about that because people would say like when you type Seth into Google, your name and material come up. So it's not like you don't have a small audience. How, what are some key, why, why did you make that decision or why are you making that decision? And what are some keys to keeping Seth organized? So um, again, this goes back to our practice. And if you're going to be a manager, you should be really good at managing. And if you're going to lead a team, a large team, you should devote a lot of time to that. Many people who have been in my shoes have been distracted by scale. So my friend Tom Peters at one point had 50 people working for him. And at that point, he wasn't good at managing 50 people, nor was he good at being Tom Peters. He was keeping a lot of balls in the air. And what I decided to do, I mean, I built one of the first internet companies. I sold it. I was one of the first vice presidents at Yahoo. Um, So I know how to fake my way through that kind of work. But it wasn't how I wanted to spend my days. So I, have, mm-hmm. I write every single word that you see with my name on it. And I have no staff, zero, on purpose. Mm-hmm. And that's because when I have hired people, it has been to build something bigger than me. And we, you know, we inv- helped create email marketing. We helped create effective online education and other things. But in all those times I'm doing that, I can feel myself stretching muscles I don't really want to stretch because there are people who are better at it, who thrive at it more than me. And so my discipline is don't go to meetings, don't watch television, and figure out how to create enough space in my day that I have no choice but to fill it by saying something interesting. You do cut out a lot of meetings if you have no team, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you really do. What? Um, how do you manage the volume? You must be inundated with requests, with speaking, with emails, all of that stuff. How do you manage it? Well, I'm not sure this is a universal uh, question, but I will try to universalize it. Um, Figuring out what you're going to say no to is really important so you don't have to do it over and over again. So I decided to say no to Twitter seven years ago and no to Facebook eight years ago. And I said no to being on social media. So that takes care of a whole bunch of problems I don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. I do have an unhealthy relationship with my email because it gives me a dopamine endorphin hit on a regular basis. And I feel sort of like I should keep that going, even though I shouldn't. So that's my vice. Uh, But I don't read the comments for a reason because what I found was that's just more incoming and it never made me a better writer. It just made me skittish. What have been the implications, the impact of the pandemic on you as a writer, a thinker? I mean, all of our travel got erased. Um, when Looking back, would you say, oh, I'm pretty much exactly the same? Or do you think it had an impact on your work or what you do or your future? I think we're all asking questions like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you're not, you should be. Um, mm. Yeah. I, uh, I ask myself questions like that all the time. You know, I think that, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, events around race and caste gave a lot of people with privilege a chance to think even more deeply about how they were contributing and what problems they were causing. 
um, my work on the Carbon Almanac made me think really deeply about me flying to Paris, giving a speech and flying back. Uh, the rise of Zoom and the fact that you and I are talking right now on Riverside helped me realize I can do my work without going somewhere. So I don't go places anymore. I don't I haven't been on an airplane in two years and I'm not getting on one. I turn down every gig I get now. If I can show up on Zoom, I do. And I do that three or four times a week happily. Um, and if I can't, I wish the people well and a new generation uh, can go do that if that's their choice. Uh, in terms of my writing, I am significantly more aware of all of our lack of immortality. And the human condition in almost every country in the world, with a few exceptions, is to pretend that we are immortal until we're not. And Mick Jagger still does rock concerts. And, you know, good for him, but not for me. So thinking hard about the impact we're making, the trail we're leaving behind, um, it's not like we need to get through today to get to tomorrow. Today is what we got. And how are we going to make the best of it? Mm. So is that a permanent decision, like no more airplanes for Seth, period? Well, I've made permanent decisions before and changed them. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you ha- about 100 days after sleep, in, 100 days in a row, I slept in the same bed for the first time since I was five years old. And I was like, oh, that's what that's like. Count me in. <laughs> so I don't miss it. I have no pangs of missing it. Like I miss walking into the office of Yo-Yo Dine when there were 45 people there on the team waiting for the next thing. I miss that. I don't miss it enough to do it again, but I miss it. I have zero missing of being backstage, hearing that there's a delay, wondering if I'm going to hit my flight back on time, being in the room with people. I miss people, but I don't miss the process. Fair enough. I think our culture... Many people would argue we have changed culturally over the last two years too. Oh yeah. A lot more isolated, more bitter. What are the changes you're seeing? And then I've got a couple of follow-up questions beyond that, but what are some of the changes you've seen socially, culturally? Well, did I, did, did you say the word bitter? Uh, perhaps I did. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I would like to say I am seeing the opposite that mm. the headlines And the people with traffic on social media are trolls. And these are people who are willing to trade self-respect for attention. And we can ignore them if we want. But the human beings that I am volunteering with on the Carbon Almanac, the people who I interact with, my friend in Italy who's dealing with a health problem, the folks who I know who just graduated from medical school, the uh, kids who are coming up, I'm seeing the opposite. I am seeing a true desire not for scale, but for quality. Not just quality in what kind of clothes am I going to wear, but quality in what is my life going to be like? What are my choices? If I'm going to be next to somebody, who do I want to be next to? And for me, you know, it used to be that what I did for a living once a week is I got on a plane. If the week was free and you had a gig, I would probably come. And now I'm like, I don't know how many more gigs I'm going to get to do. Let's think about why you're even doing this gig. And whether I'm the best person to do it or whether you should call this person. Because quality is something that we sort of left behind in our race for more. And um, yeah, I think it is true that the baby boomers who have made the world about them since 1960 are now making the world about their demise. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way. This is the last cycle that the generation in charge is going to be in charge. But that doesn't mean that's most people. Most people aren't that. Most people are looking for possibility and deciding that possibility doesn't have to be a storage unit stuffed with stuff they're never going to use again. I've been thinking a lot about changing inputs because I think you're right. The trolls have dominated broadcast media, headlines, social media, et cetera. When you think about changing your inputs, how do you or do you have some sources that you're like, ah, this is how I want to get my news. These are the people I want to connect with. Like, do you have any recommendations, I guess, is what I'm asking on changing the inputs? Because you're right, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you want to increase your anxiety, just do what everybody else is doing. Yeah, and I think it's worth repeating that. If, you know, if there's a stand-up comic who every time you watch them, it makes you a little bit misogynist, just stop watching them. You have Mm -hmm. no obligation. No obligation to know 
what Wolf Blitzer thinks of as the breaking news. Because mm. the fact is, the world got by just fine when breaking news took 24 hours. And if you can wait six hours to get it filtered before it shows up on your desk, you're not going to miss Armageddon, I promise. If it's ready for you, it'll come for you. So with that said, I love finding a blog with a voice of authenticity and authority that isn't doing it for the money, that isn't doing it for the attention. And I'll just add it to my RSS reader, and that's what shows up. And if a troll comes across my path, I just don't write back. They're, they just, you know, you just block me and move on. Because you can't teach the world a lesson. But what you can do is the same way you don't eat Frosted Flakes three times a day, you don't have to inhale stuff just because everybody else is. You can take a deep breath and say, what is my work? Who am I trying to change? What change am I seeking to make in the world? And how do I outfit myself so I can do that and be better at the same time? I think about that on a regular basis because, you know, I'm taking July off this year. In July, you're going to be up in Algonquin Park. Um, and let's let's be honest, up in Algonquin Park, you don't get a signal even if you tried if you're in most places in the park. And you can be off the grid for two weeks, a month. And it's amazing how the world keeps spinning without you, how you missed all the drama, etc. And yet, I say all that because you're unplugging from some sources, but I also listen to your podcast and I subscribe to your daily blog. It's not like you're short of ideas. Can you talk a little bit more about your input sources because you come up with the most interesting stories I've never heard of, <laughs> and the most interesting people I've never heard of. So clearly there is input going on. This is just not Seth sitting in his own little universe pontificating. You've got great inputs. Well, thank you. Um, I don't watch news. I don't watch cable news. Mm. I don't watch television news. I don't watch social media news. I don't want to know about breaking news. I saw 9-11 through the window of my office. It didn't make me better knowing it 10 minutes before anybody else. And um, most of the things that you are referring to happened backwards. What happens is I see something in the world I don't understand, that I can't understand why that would succeed. I can't understand why that would not succeed. And then I come up with a theory as to why and how that would be of use to people who read my work. But now I need to pin a story to the theory to help it sit with people. So then I go looking for a story that makes my point, not the other way around. And um, anyone can do this. It's just mm. about deciding to notice things. And one story that I haven't told in a while, which I think is really useful for someone who's thinking about this. Back a long time ago, when you and I were starting out, they didn't have voicemail. When mm. you called an office, the receptionist would answer the phone. If the person wasn't in, they would write down on a pink slip of paper while you were out, who called and what their number was. And then when you came back from lunch, you had to pick up your pink slips, but not other people's pink slips. So there was an actual industry of how do we sort and store these little pink slips. So my first day of my first job, there's 30 people who work there. And on the receptionist desk is a plastic carousel with a spinner on it with 30 slots. After me, they had to buy a new one, 30 slots. <laughs> and on each slot, with a Dymo label maker, they had written the name of the person. And the people were in order of chronology because you added people when they got hired. <laughs> so I walk in the first day and the receptionist says, this is where we put the slips. You spin it till you find your name and then you take your slips out. And I thought to myself, there must be a reason for this, but I'm going to have to look at this thing every single day, spinning, spinning. This is silly. So I reach over and I grab a paper clip from the paperclip dispenser, and I put it next to my name. This hurts no one. And now I just got to spin to the paperclip, and I'm fine. <laughs> and with, I'm not making this up. Within four days, the entire thing was festooned with flags and post-its and different colored paperclips. And it, made it, it saved everybody a minute a day of spinning. You just spin to your paper, pipe cleaner or whatever you put there. And the reason I tell the story is not because I'm a genius, because I'm not. I'm telling the story because I'm sure other people thought of this. And they decided it wasn't worth the risk. And I did it because it felt generous to me to say, you can do this too. And that's my method. I've been using the same method ever since. 
<laughs> well, you've got a project that you have been working on. You call it the most important project of your life. And I've got it in my hand. It's called the Carbon, Carbon Almanac. It's not too late. You've got it in your hand. It's an incredible book, Seth. Can you tell us a little bit about its origins? I think it's important when we face a problem that we talk about it. I can't think of a problem that has gone away because we refuse to talk about it. And in almost every area of our life, conversation, not argument, not yelling, but conversation leads to coordinated action. And here's what I discovered. I wrote my first blog post 16 years ago about climate change, and it didn't solve the problem. A blog post isn't going to solve the problem. If it would have, I'd write one. Um, the problem is going to be solved by systemic action. We cannot, you know, we made a trillion plastic bags last year. I'm not exaggerating. Usually when you use the word trillion, you're exaggerating. I'm not. We made a trillion plastic bags last year. So if Seth and Carrie stop using plastic bags, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. But if we create systemic solutions, we will be honoring the people who came before us and the people who came after us because systemic solutions will create possibility and clean up our act. But the only way to have systemic solutions is to have a conversation. The only way to have a conversation is for people to share what is actually happening. Not what's you know shaded or amplified or exaggerated, but what is actually happening. So I used to make almanacs for a living before I was a well-known author. I made the business almanac, made the women's almanac, the celebrity almanac. And I thought, there's a bunch of facts here. And there are too many facts here. And the reports that the United Nations puts out are indecipherable. And things seem to conflict. And a lot of people are lying. Why don't we just organize it? Why don't we add cartoons and graphs and tables and help people see? And our motto is don't take our word for it. You can look it up because we have a thousand footnotes all throughout. And so I said, I'm not going to build this myself. And so I'm going to volunteer and I'm going to find other volunteers. And within a week, 300 people in 41 countries were helping. And in less than 100 days, we built a 97,000-word almanac, fact-checked, proofread, illustrated, laid out, and to the publisher on time. And so that's what this is. This is a chance to have a conversation. So, Seth, there are climate optimists and climate pessimists. And, you know, uh, do you think, like, how bleak do you think the situation facing Earth is? And how hopeful are you? that we can mitigate or reverse the problem. Now, the subtitle is it's not too late. So I take it there's a bit of optimism there, but what's your view on the future of the climate and the planet? I am both. I am an optimist mm. and a pessimist. Here's the reason I'm an optimist. Um, in uh, the 1880s, I, the city where I live, New York, where when my great-grandfather got here, uh, people dumped raw sewage in the river. And they did it because it was convenient and cheap. And when they discovered it was killing the oysters and killing the people, they didn't say to everybody, oh, please, if it's convenient for you, please stop uh, dumping stuff in the river. They said, don't dump stuff in the river anymore. And now it's clean. Um, in 1920, if you tried to cross the street, you were going to get hit by a car because there were no rules for cars and pedestrians were dying right and left. And in the last few years, the medical establishment has come together in an organized but not centralized way and saved the lives of millions and millions and millions of people. We are capable of building and delivering a cell phone to billions of people around the world. Human beings can do amazing things when they work in sync, in community. So if we hurry, things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. We are getting closer and closer to uh, really beautiful, efficient systems that will allow us to live better than ever before. On the other hand, since you and I began talking, more than a dozen creatures went extinct and they will never come back. And that's more than 100 a day. And the ice caps are melting. And once they melt, they can't be refrozen. And once Miami's underwater, Miami's gone for good. So it's not a horror movie. It's real life. And the science is really clear. We can be both. We can be optimists and pessimists. Pessimists about the natural world really waking up and telling us to stop and optimists about what happens when we put the market to work, when we put community to work to save things. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, I even hate to go here, but there are a good share of climate deniers out there. I don't know the exact percentage. And uh, for some reason, Seth, you know, my own community, my own tribe, uh, Christians, there's been a, a statistically disproportionate number of climate deniers in the Christian community. So I just, I think we need to go there and just address this. Why would someone who would be a denier and just say, no, Seth, you know, over the years, there's been ice ages and there's been heat waves and this is just normal. Why would someone like that, uh, what would you say to them? Well, I think there's two people in that camp. There are people in that camp who are trolls who want to have an argument and will never change their mind no matter what. And we shouldn't waste any time arguing with someone who just wants to have an argument because they're not going to change their mind no matter what. All I can ask you is, please get out of the way. Um, The thing is, what if you're wrong? Because if I'm wrong and we end up with clean, free solar and wind power and air we can breathe and a stable, resilient society for no good reason, okay. But if you're wrong, I'm not sure you want to live with that. But to the second group of people, I would say this. In 1982, uh, an engineer at Exxon wrote, a long memo describing what was going to happen to the climate. And we reprint that memo, two pages of it, in the Almanac. To a tenth of a degree, he was right about what was going to happen to the world 40 years later. This is an Exxon scientist. And he's basically blowing the whistle, saying we're in trouble. we're in trouble. And Exxon buried that and then started a disinformation campaign. But even the oil companies now are saying, it doesn't do us any good to be rich if we're all dead. And so what I would say to someone who has a good heart and good spirit is at least get up to speed so we can have the conversation. Don't judge the data before you look at the data. Take a look. Take a look at the photos. We're publishing a a book of 150 photos from around the world. Take a look at the photo of what happened in China six months after they went to lockdown. It's astonishing. You can look it up on the internet right now. Six months after China went into lockdown, satellite photos show that for the first time, you can see the city, that the nitrous oxide disappeared. It's just gone because they stopped making more of it. And 8 million people died from coal in 2018. 8 million. It was one of the five leading causes of death in the world. No one made that up. You can look it up. Mm. So given that that's the case, that 8 million people are going to die from coal, should we burn coal? I think it's a pretty simple question. You don't have to know a lot of science to answer that question. You know, it's interesting, the version of the argument, or the argument you just made is like a version of, you probably heard of Pascal's wager. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, you know, Christian preachers have used that for years. It's like, okay, well, you're an atheist, but what if you're wrong? Wouldn't wouldn't you rather live as a Christian and try this out? Uh, because if it turns out that Christianity is right, well, isn't it better to live on the side of faith than the side of, you know, non-belief? Now, I don't think that's been persuasive for everybody, but I think that's a really good point. And I love how you're talking about this becoming a conversation. And, um, you know, rather than an argument, because so much of what happens online is polemic or political or partisan, Um, do do you have any theory or thoughts on how this has become a partisan issue? Like we managed to turn a pandemic into a partisan issue, which I never would have predicted, but we did it. And so much has become political. And, and I'm just curious, like why, why, what is your theory on why this has become so political? I have a two part theory. The first part Hmm. is there is a long, deep thread of, Uh, It's none of your business. Stay out of my Mm. life. And particularly in North America, but in many parts of the world, it's none of your business. Stay out of my life. But at the same time, I have never met somebody on any part of the political spectrum who says we shouldn't have a speed limit for school zones because that's fine. You can have a speed limit for school zones that you can say you can do what you want in your yard, but don't dump your waste on my yard because your Mm. business ends when my business begins. So one of the challenges of trying to turn climate into a political conversation is it doesn't really line up with that. Because all of a sudden, somebody 
who has you know more money than whoever is flying a private jet over your house and ruining your kid's life. Is that okay or not? The second half of it is that what politics has become is not governance, but a chance to take topics out of conversation. Now, when we say, and we just got a note from a university that we offered copies of the Almanac to, they said, we can't take this book, it's too political. And it's, wait, so you're saying you can't look it up? You can't talk about it? That's what political means now. And Mm. when people, the oil companies, don't want us to talk about it, they're going to tell us it's political because now we can't because we're not supposed to talk about things that are political. I can tell you that Republicans and Democrats in the United States, people in more than 40 countries all worked on this book. And we don't all vote the same way. and We don't all care about the same stuff because Ooh. science is science. And Almanac is a collection of data. There are flags in many countries. The Almanac lists the flags. The Almanac didn't decide what the flags are. They just listed them. So what is going on here with this is political is simple. There are people who have an agenda and they want to change the way other people think. They don't want you to think for yourself. And part Mm. of what it is to have a conversation is not to say, what does the boss think? Not what does the people in my tribe tell me to think? It's after I think for myself, I can decide where I want to be on this issue. And the issue is truly existential. Whether or not you have kids, the thing is, we are going for the first generation to leave things significantly worse than we found them. And I'm not proud of that. And I don't want to just leave this to the next generation. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that I think uh, an argument that I hear on a regular basis deals with the economics of mm-hmm. climate change. It's like, well, we have a lot of jobs in the oil industry. We have a lot of jobs, you know, in traditional fossil fuels. Um, what are some of the economic implications of climate change? Right. So, solar and wind at this moment are cheaper than oil and gas in many parts of the world, and they will get cheaper still. There's almost no economic reason to build a coal plant or an oil refinery anymore because the math just doesn't work. Now, when the internet came along, travel agents, bookstore owners, lots of people said, oh, no, 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 don't do that because our jobs are threatened. But we did it anyway because it made things better and more convenient along the way. And many of those people have now found other productive things to do. Now, in the United States, Mm. there's about 100,000 full-time coal miners. It's not a lot of people. Canada is one of the five biggest producers of oil in the world. There's a lot Mm. of money there. But almost all the money that is being produced by oil in Canada is going to a handful of really, really wealthy organizations. It is not going to typical humans. When we build off-grid energy that's free and clean, the amount of productivity that will be created is enormous. And the transition is going to be hard. Of course the transition is going to be hard. What's the alternative? How much is it going to cost us to make it so that the next storm, New York City subways aren't underwater? How much is it going to cost the people who own ski areas in um, British Columbia? to find something else to do when it stops snowing in British Columbia. I can go down a very long list of things that somehow we'll find the money to pay for, but it would be far easier and cheaper to simply do a different thing all day based on resilient, sustainable approaches. I think it was uh, Tony Fidel, maybe in an interview with Tim Ferriss, who said that the world's first trillionaire with a T Mm-hmm. will probably be the person who cracks the climate change code, the problem that we have. You know, in the same way Steve Jobs made a boatload of money when he revolutionized in a popular way technology, everything from computers to the phone to iPods to beyond that. You know, that's the argument. What are some of the opportunities economically when it comes to climate change? So here's one that I just came across last week. Um This company figured out that you can take the shells from shrimp and make them into packing material that is super efficient, doesn't smell, and is super easy to recycle. You just dump it in your garden. And 
they're going to make a fortune. That's not good news for the people who make those super annoying styrofoam pellets that are going to ruin everybody's life. I don't feel bad for those people because they had a really good Uh run. And if you're the the insurgent, you know, as Schumpeter says, it's creative destruction. It leads to the next thing. And when we think about, you know, fast fashion, we went from having two or three seasons a year for clothing to new styles coming out every week. And as Mm -hmm. a result, five to seven percent of all the carbon we're spewing is because we're buying, making and buying clothes we don't need. And there are entire countries like Chile that are under many feet of trash because these fast fashion companies just dump stuff there. And now it's against the law. You can't bring your leftover sweaters to Chile and dump them on the shore. The point is that if you want to make a living making sustainable clothes that we can wear for a long time, you'll do great. Great. Because the number of people who want to buy them is very large. And so, again, we see the shift. No one complained when the gap got everyone to switch to khaki. The people at Hart, Schaffner, and Marx didn't say, oh, we've worked so hard to make suits. How dare you switch to khaki? Well, (laughs) we're going to switch again. And the thing that I got to insert here is everyone who's listening has heard the phrase carbon footprint and been told that we need to lower our carbon footprint. What you will learn from the almanac is that that phrase was invented by the ad agency Ogilvy and Mather in the 1980s, and their client was British Petroleum. And their client hired them to invent carbon footprint for a reason, because if you feel like a hypocrite, you're not going to speak up. And the fact is, we're all hypocrites. And whether or not you have a spiritual faith or not, if you've been in a room with someone preaching at you, they're a hypocrite too. And we need to let the hypocrites speak up because how are we going to get better? Because there's no one who's not a hypocrite. And you don't have to wait until your carbon footprint is zero to lead to systemic change. What you can say is, I already use 100 times more carbon than someone in Borelli, India, or somebody in Burundi. And I'm never going to decrease it by 99 times. So given Mm. that I'm not at the bottom of the carbon ladder, what am I going to do about it? And the answer is systemic change. If we change our systems, people will change their choices. And if we change our choices, we will ratchet this in the other direction. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about that because I'm going to Costco tonight Mm -hmm. and there's things I want. And Costco to me, I mean, they're in many ways a very ethical company. They pay their employees a living wage. They do good things. But that clamshell packaging... Like, tell me about it. Like, Seth, it drives me crazy. And so part of me feels guilty. I've got a recycling bin in my backyard that's about the size of a small house. And it'll go out there. And I hope it's going somewhere. You're going to feel worse about the next thing I say, Carrie. Okay, then please say it. They're going to burn that plastic. They're not going to recycle it. I know. I know. That's probably true, isn't it? It, 6% of all the plastic is recycled. The rest of it is burned. And they, you know who invented plastic recycling? The plastics industry invented it. And they did it so we would leave them alone, so we wouldn't feel guilty. And what we could have done instead is to say, you're never allowed to empty the bin. The bin's just going to keep getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And then you would speak up because actually Costco doesn't want to have clamshells. Clamshells are more expensive than the alternative, but it's the system that requires clamshells because they trained all their suppliers to put stuff in clamshells to prevent shoplifting and blah, 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 blah. So now we expect a certain thing that when you get, you know, I got this remote, it came in a little cardboard box and deep down I'm like, well, that was, I spent a lot for this. Why do I only get a little cardboard box? And then I realized, wait a minute, I don't want it to come in a clamshell. I'm just used to that. And so once we price carbon fairly, We will make different decisions and Costco will make different decisions and Logitech will make different decisions and things will get more Mm. convenient, not less. But I I still remember years ago, someone wrote a dismissive article about Amazon. They were comparing going to the local bookstore to buy a book to opening their browser, establishing an account with Amazon, typing in all their information, typing in their credit card, learning how to use Amazon and buying a book. And they were right for the first book. It's way more convenient to go to the local bookstore. But for the 400th book, guess who wins? (laughs) And the same thing is true here. We're going to build a better world for more people if we change our systems. Mm. Yeah, how does that even begin? I mean, because I think about it and I thought, you know, if I was a manufacturer, 
it would make sense. Like Patagonia has made some big changes. And I notice, you know, Patagonia is kind of cool right now as far as fashion goes, but they've, you know, they sell really good stuff. If you're done with it, if you don't donate it, you send it back to Patagonia. Yeah. They turn it into something productive, etc. How do you get other employers and manufacturers to embrace that attitude? So well, let me start with the neighborhood first and then I'll move my way up. If someone's listening yeah. to this, you have 10 friends in your neighborhood. If you and your 10 friends go to the Board of Education, you can probably get the cafeteria to have Meatless Monday because mm. it's not that hard, right? Every Monday, all the teenagers can have anything they want, but there's no meat. Um, meat is one of the single largest producers of carbon in the world, carbon, greenhouse gas. It turns out methane is 80 times more powerful for 10 years than carbon is. And wow. only 10 of you got one-fifth of the days of the cafeteria to be meat-free. Well, if you do that, the people who sell stuff to cafeterias will start to sell more things that don't have meat in them. And if they do that, the people who provide them... So now the system has changed. Not because you and your family have Meatless Monday, but because the whole school district has Meatless Monday. And then if I think about it from the point of view of Amazon or Patagonia, if Amazon has to pay for every package they send out, knowing that if they don't, the community has to pay for it, Amazon's going to really quickly change the way they package the stuff they send you, aren't they? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, the engine of capitalism, which so many of your listeners applaud, will work in the correct direction. Instead of stealing from everybody who has to get rid of all the stuff, even though they didn't volunteer for that, the people who are paying for it will get rid of all the stuff. And so then when you start to say, to uh, the system as it starts to pay attention. You know how you can make a lot of money? You can make a lot of money by using less carbon than you did last year. And if you said that to Wall Street, you can bet it would take about 14 minutes for a whole bunch of companies to change what they do for a living because that's profitable. And now you've got all these people who are making stuff with the intent of using less carbon. And We've solved all these other problems with capitalism. We can solve this one as long as we are being honest about the inputs and the costs. Hmm. What are some of the other innovative solutions? Like, I mean, it is a very thick book with a ton of great ideas on the personal and, and societal level. What are some other things that really caught your imagination as, you know, this could be leverage that could change a lot? Like one or two things that, man, if we did this, we could really move the needle. So it's important to understand, we didn't make up any of these things. What we did was mm -hmm. we looked at, hundreds and hundreds of us looked at it, everything we could find, said, if this is interesting and true, we're going to list it. And we have a, a form on our site for every single page, it has its own page, where you can let us know if we made a mistake. And uh, so far we have found one, and it was tiny. Uh, so with that said, uh, a billion people on this planet don't have electricity. And I don't know if you've ever been to a village at seven o'clock at night that has no electricity, but it's astonishing to see. And once people can get electricity, they tend to say thanks and they tend to want more. And so how are we going to electrify the last billion houses? Well, one way we can do it is build a coal plant. One way we can do it is burn stuff. But the other way we can do it is realize we don't have to build a grid and that grid doesn't have to be controlled by a despot. We can create situations for off-grid power. And there's a company called D-Light that's doing just that. So D-Light shows up with a box a little bit bigger than a toaster, and it's enough to charge your cell phone and give your kids light to read all night to do their homework with. And once you've done that, you have probably made a little bit of extra money because you've been able to do work because you have light, and that lets you buy a slightly bigger one, and now you can get a sewing machine, and on and on and on. So we got a billion homes to electrify. Isn't that a smart way to do it? And it's, they're already up to uh, more than 80 million people around the world now have access to electricity because of that insight. And we had 150 years to do it with oil and kerosene, and we couldn't. And now in just a few years, we can do it with solar. When we think about how people are switching their transport, the number one fastest growing form of transportation in the world is the electric bicycle. Electric bicycles are super cheap and are actually more efficient than walking. That we can go further with less energy on an electric bike than we can by growing food and eating it. 
And hmm. as a result, we're going to see an entire generation of city dwellers take mass transit into their own hands by going around in electric bikes instead. That means that the cities are going to have to respond with appropriate regulations and bike lanes and things like that. But again, what we know is that 40 cars take up way more room than one bus. And we're going to have to do something if the population is going to keep growing and we keep multiplying. And the laws of physics don't get suspended just because we met well. So when we think mm. about things like electric bikes, when we think about a windmill in your backyard, when we think about the power of using hydrogen to power things, because hydrogen, you can't get hydrogen, you have to make hydrogen, and you make it with a windmill or a solar panel. And then when you're done burning it, it just turns into water vapor. Nothing else. And it's silent and safe. So there are all of these things happening around the edges. But what's missing is there isn't a market as much as there should be because we are still selling oil too cheap. People are dying every day because of national arguments about who owns the oil, because of uh, the pollution that oil causes. They're dying. We're killing them so that we can drive somewhere a little cheaper. And if we priced it fairly, we would make different decisions. What are some personal choices? I mean, this is something that's been important to my wife and I for years. I mean, we started recycling when there was barely any, barely any recycling and probably before they burned all of it. But, you know, we started making decisions like that, trying to buy organic as much as we could. And, you know, I'm also very conscious. I mean, being on video a lot, you, you feel the pressure to have a new outfit every season or something like that. But I remember my grandmother's closet and it was tiny, yeah. Seth. It was the width of my, my iMac that I'm looking at you on. You, yeah. could, you could put your Sunday clothes, your work clothes and a spare set and that's it. Like you go to a 1920s house, tiny closets. You go today, you've got a room this size and that's the master walk-in Correct. closet for all of your clothes. So we're trying to reduce, we're trying to recycle. But what are some, some small decisions you can make that perhaps actually make a difference? Um, okay, so I'm going to repeat, I'm a hypocrite, um, but I will also mm -hmm. tell you I've been a vegetarian for more than 30 years, and I haven't been on an airplane in two, and my whole house uh, is electric vehicles. But that doesn't give me any <gasps> authority. It just tells you I've been thinking about it. And uh, as a hypocrite, what I will tell you is this. You can go for less or you can go for more. And there are both threads in the environmental movement. Less says we should have fewer humans. Humans should have less convenience and we should be cold in the winter and hot in the summer, and we should eat less and do less. That's a really hard thing to sell. And the other thing we can sell is more. And that means more possibility and more connection and more opportunity. So what I believe you should do is not fall into the carbon footprint myth, but instead say, every time I spend a dollar, I'm sending a signal to the market. So if you buy things that are in glass, even if they cost a dollar more than things that are in plastic, the market will pay attention. If you mm. buy an unproven electric car, thus making a company like Rivian an instant success, it makes it so that more companies are going to want to be like Rivian. Now, that Rivian might not be perfect. You might be on the waiting list for a long time. It doesn't matter. You're getting more by leaning into what could be next. Is it perfect? No, but nothing is perfect. The point is we are signal setters and we can send signals either by working in community, by writing letters, by doing, you know, in my community, uh, leaf blowers are fairly common and leaf blowers didn't exist 30 years ago. A leaf blower, gas powered leaf blower puts out as much carbon in one hour as driving a car from where you live to Los Angeles and back. Think Whoa. about that. And it's also really noisy and not that safe. So, if you say to the gardener, please don't use a leaf blower, they will nod, but they will keep using it because they're under competitive pressure to do so. Because if they don't, you're going to, you know, someone else will hire them. In my town, they made leaf blowers against the law. And as a result, the gardeners have no choice but to switch to electric leaf blowers. And they have responded by saying, wow, this is quieter and more convenient and we like it better. But it only happened because 40 people wrote a letter to Nikki, the mayor, and said, enough of this nonsense. We can't do this voluntarily, just like we can't ask people to stop peeing in the river. Let's just mm. say no more leaf blowers. And then they'll be gone. 
really, really fascinating. Anything else, Seth, that you think is worth noting? And I appreciate, and my children and grandchildren, I don't have any yet, but maybe one day I will, uh, will also appreciate, I think, what you're doing and so many other people are doing. Well, thank you. I, there's a bunch of free stuff at thecarbonalmanac.org, including a kid's book, uh, which has been downloaded tens of thousands of times. It's beautifully illustrated. There's a mm. photo book. There's a daily email. There's 40 podcasts. And you can switch your search engine. And if you switch yes. to a search engine called Ecosia with one click, two clicks maybe, um, it's faster and less ads and more privacy than Google. And they plant a tree every time you do 43 searches. And I personally have planted hundreds of trees since I switched. And it doesn't cost me anything. And I feel good about that. Yeah, I've, I've switched uh, browser as well. It's very easy to set up. So we'll put the links in the show notes to all of that. And I got to ask you, Buckminster Fuller, why did he make page 328? Okay, so do you remember those yellow envelopes at work with the red string on them? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, those were what? Interdepartmental right. memos. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're showing 100%. our age here. But the way it would work uh-huh. to save money on Xeroxes and carbon paper, someone would write a memo and then they would put it in that yellow envelope and write the name of the person who got it next and drop it mm-hmm. in the interoffice mail and it would be delivered to them. And then the next person would keep reusing the envelope and it would travel its way around the office. And so the back cover inside of the almanac is one of those envelopes. And what we are trying to say to you is, now that you've made it to the end, write your name here and go hand it to the next person. Because we are not here to sell books. None of us make a penny. I'm a volunteer. I don't care if I only sell two of these, as long as it keeps spreading and moving on. So when we listed the names in the back, we thought, well, what would be clever? We listed the first person who identified the greenhouse effect and carbon gas. We identified, we listed, uh, I think the person who did that very valuable work of uh, measuring carbon in the atmosphere in Hawaii. And then because I've been a Bucky Fuller fan since I was 12, we listed Buckminster Fuller. (laughs) That's fantastic. Okay. So the website again for this, Seth, is uh, carbonalmanac.org. Yes. You can put the the in or not. We got them all. The. Okay. Fantastic. And of course, to find you, just type Seth into any browser. Or Ecosia, even. Ecosia, and you'll find Seth Godin. (laughs) Seth, thank you. I really appreciate what you're doing uh, with your life, but also with your impact. And you've helped just millions of leaders around the world, including, I'm pretty sure, almost every single listener of this podcast. So thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you for leading. The work you do really matters. I appreciate the time. Thanks. Thank you for watching the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope it's helped you thrive in life and leadership. And if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, inside you'll find everything you need to lead, grow, and run a church. And now, a word from our sponsor, Belay. If you've ever struggled with bookkeeping, watch this video because not only is it going to increase your peace of mind, but you're going to wonder why you waited so long. It's tax season. I still need all of your vendors' W-9 forms from last year. Here. (laughs) That's nice, sweetheart, but I'm not thirsty. Whoa, whoa. A belay bookkeeper? Really? Is that where we are now? I took care of the forms for Dan this morning. They are already in your inbox. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, let's let them enjoy their day. Never miss a moment. Modern staffing from Belay. Great, please. You know there's not even any real tea in there? Bubba, she's a young girl. Let her have fun. Have fun today, sweetie. Get out. Go. You are being ridiculous.